The Magicka Templar is one of the coolest and most electric classes in the Elder Scrolls Online. This class has some incredibly unique abilities that feel phenomenal to utilize, as well as some specialized passives and buffs unlike any other class in the game. In Update 40, the Templar is arguably the strongest class for single target damage, pumping out more DPS than ever before. This video will give you all of the information that you need to know about what's changed, the class itself, and how to maximize your damage with the Magplar in content. Be sure to take a look at the description to not only get a plethora of resources from myself and other creators alike, but also to see the timestamps in case there is any one individual topic that you're interested in regarding the plar, or even if you want to go back and rewatch one section over another. We have a lot to discuss, so let's get into it. Getting into the basic build information for the patch, starting with our race options. Both Dark Elf and High Elf are the absolute strongest choices that we have, with each giving a near identical DPS output. The only difference is that High Elf gives 100 more max mag overall, and Dark Elf gives a ton of max stam. Otherwise, the stat bonuses are the same. This creates a negligible DPS difference, making my personal go-to Dark Elf, as this will allow your character to be versatile and have the ability to switch between mag and stam specs effectively. High Elf will technically produce the highest DPS output, but again by a complete negligible margin. That said though, High Elf does offer some sustain help, so if you're sticking to mag, this definitely is not a bad option, and is in fact the race used in the parse. There are only a few more races worth mentioning for the mag spec of this class. The Khajiit race offers max resources, though less than that of High Elf or Dark Elf, as well as crit damage, making this race a good option for groups that are unoptimized, some 4-man scenarios, and most solo or 2-man scenarios. Orc provides a fair spell and weapon damage increase, but lacks resources, resulting in a pretty decent damage loss compared to High Elf, Dark Elf, or the situationally relevant Khajiit. Finally, for newer players, Breton can end up being a really strong option as it offers the greatest damage to sustain balance, performing the weakest out of any of the given options, but providing the most sustain help. Sustain can be really tough starting out, and there is no worse damage loss than running out of resources, so while you're getting the hang of resource management, this could be a decent option. For our Mundus this patch, the Thief will provide the most overall damage compared to any other alternative, especially in optimized 12-man content. Even in unoptimized groups, though, you will very rarely use a different Mundus. Very rarely doesn't mean always though, so if you need to make up discrepancies in penetration or crit damage, the Lover can help with pen and the Shadow can help with crit damage. As a final option, again for newer players, the Atronaut can be good to help with sustain issues that you may experience early on. For our attributes, we are dumping all 64 points into Mag, it shouldn't be necessary for the sake of sustain or survivability in content to allocate these anywhere else. So we'll take the highest damage gain that we can by making our mag pool as high as possible. Regarding gear, our traits and enchants will be the same across all setups. For our gear weight, we will typically opt for a 6 medium, 1 light setup. This can vary though depending on group comp, related to topics like penetration, crit damage, and even sustain. For our body pieces, we will run them all as the divine trait with max magicka enchants. For our jewelry, we will run them all as the bloodthirsty trait with spell damage enchants. Finally, for our weapons on the front bar, if you opt for a dual wield setup, you'll run the main hand Nernhone with a poison enchant, and the offhand charged with a flame enchant. Two handed weapons, such as a greatsword, inferno staff, or bow, should be run precise with a flame damage enchant. On the back bar, if you're running a dual wield setup, you'll run both weapons infused. If you're running dual wield on the front bar as well, your back bar enchants will be one shock and one weapon damage enchant. If you're running a two handed weapon on the front bar, your back bar enchants will be one poison and one weapon damage enchant. Otherwise, any two handed weapon that you run on the back bar should be infused used with the weapon damage enchant. For our consumables, we have plenty of situational options to consider. The option that will provide the most overall damage will be the green max mag food options. This is the food that we use on the dummy. However, in content, if you find that you need a little more survivability, you can opt to run by stat food, which offers only slightly more max mag and health. This will be a very small damage loss, but is usually worth it for the massive increase in HP. In situations where you are having a very difficult time sustaining, Ghastly Eyeball provides the next most amount of max mag after the previously mentioned options, but offers a ton of magic of recovery, instantly solving almost any sustain issue you might have. Again, less max mag means a damage loss compared to other options, but only assuming you can sustain the other options effectively, as magging out is the biggest DPS loss you can suffer. If you're looking for an option that gives a balance between sustain and survivability, Clockwork Citrus Filet will provide a lower amount of max health and max mag than Bystat or Ghastly, but will offer a bit of recovery as well. This is a nice middle ground option for tricky survivability and sustain type fights. For our potions this patch, we will be opting to run heroism pots. Normally, we ensure that our major prophecy and sorcery buffs are sourced through our potions, but the Plar is a bit of a unique class, in the sense that we can get one of these buffs with a skill. Vampire's Bane provides major prophecy, so instead of doubling up on this buff,
off with the typical alliance spell power potions we can source the prophecy with vampire's bane and the sorcery with the skill degeneration this allows us to run heroism pots which lets us use more ultis over the course of an entire fight on the dummy once we throw our last shooting star at about 40 percent however we'll be able to switch to spell damage potions and cut degeneration and vampire's bane from our rotation altogether which allows for more casts of radiant oppression these potions are also very expensive as they require dragon's room dragon's blood and columbine to make keep in mind that they will read as essence of magicka since they are so expensive however if you don't have the gold to invest i'd suggest using tristat potions these will at least restore mag and stam as well as give major endurance and intellect the stam and mag recovery buffs but lack the ult regen finally if you are not able to source the damage and crit buffs as mentioned for whatever reason i'd suggest using the alliance spell draft or essence of spell power potions as an alternative ultimately sourcing the major buffs is far more important than minor heroism so if you have to drop vampire's bane for whatever reason run these potions instead in fact in xe switching to these potions will allow us to drop degen from our rotation and allow for more casts of radiant oppression in xe you can craft these by combining cornflower lady smock and water hyacinth or you can purchase the aligned spell power potions from cyrodiil for our champion points this patch we will be opting to run deadly aim Thaumaturge, Wrathful Strikes, and Exploiter. Exploiter acts as a double-edged sword, being the strongest CP in terms of boosting your overall DPS output, but requiring an additional buff-up time for your support to be aware of, as well as requiring you to track off-balance and play this 6 second burst phase as if it were in cap on a nightblade. This means that you need to prepare for and burst during these windows. This is extremely difficult on console as tracking the cooldown requires all buffs to be turned on, making it difficult to spot the single icon that you are looking for among the masses. This will usually result in exploiter not being worth much more than other alternatives to most players, especially in content. This CP shines though in trash pulls when skills like scythe are being used to provide AoE off balance. In short pulls where you shouldn't be using much more than your spammables anyway, you end up getting all of the benefits of Exploiter without the hindrances of uptimes or brain power to worry about. Thaumaturge is the most important CP we can slot as it will buff Radiant Oppression as well as most of our abilities in general, including the Dot from Trap, the Dot from Stampede, the Dot from Carve, Degen, Ritual, and Vampire's Bane. Deadly Aim is the next strongest CP that we can use, as this will buff our heaviest hitting abilities, that is, Radiant Oppression and Power of the Light. In fact, these two skills alone make up about 30% of our overall DPS output. A good rule of thumb for the Templar is to run anything and everything that will buff Radiant Oppression. Finally, Wrathful Strikes becomes worth running on a Plar over any other option, as the vast majority of this class's damage, roughly around 70%, is based on Deadly and Thom. Take, for example, one of the only skills that isn't buffed by these CP, Puncturing Sweep. The damage increase provided by Master at Arms or Biting Aura would be larger than the damage increase provided by Wrathful Strikes to that skill individually. But since Master and Biting would not buff a high overall percent of our DPS output and Wrathful would buff all of our damage, Wrathful becomes more worthwhile. Regarding the other primary damage CP, Biting Aura will be your next best CP to use if you wanted to replace something like Exploiter. This skill buffs the next highest percentage of your overall damage output, buffing both jabs and our AoEs. Biting is also worthwhile in AoE burst situations whenever running an AoE spammable, such as Trash Pulls for example. Master at Arms is the weakest of the alternative CP and will rarely, if ever, be run. As some situational alternatives for your CP in optimization situations that leave you a bit under pen, you can opt to run Force of Nature in place of either Exploiter or Wrathful. This CP gives about 660 pen per status effect, which, in an organized group, should reliably give you an average of about 2,000 extra penetration over the course of an entire fight. Likewise, in situations where you might have to spec into Light Armor or are simply under the crit cap for any reason, you should run either Backstabber or fighting finesse to ensure that you are still at crit cap. Backstabber should be run in fights where you can consistently flank the boss, that is, stand behind it, for the entire duration of a fight, and fighting finesse should be used when you cannot accomplish this. Getting into the gear information, I'm going to discuss the most relevant beginner setups that you can start with, as well as a comprehensive list of all of the relevant meta and situationally meta gear sets, alternate sets, mythics, monster sets, and arena weapons. Starting off with the beginner setups, Order's Wrath is a really strong and easy to obtain set from the overlands of High Isle, requiring the High Isle chapter, assuming you don't have a guildhouse with an attunable for the set or even a friend that can craft it for you. This set offers a lot of crit chance and crit damage to essential and particularly difficult stats to come by early on. This set can also be purchased from guild traders. Back Alley Gourmand is a solid alternative to Order's Wrath, providing a ton of crit damage but no extra crit chance with its fifth piece. This set requires the 
the Firesong DLC and can be found in the Overlands of Galen or be purchased in Guild Traders. Mother Sorrow is a really strong and easy to obtain set, providing an insane amount of critical chance. No DLC required for this one as it can be farmed in the Overlands of Deshaun or be purchased in Guild Traders. Spinners provides an absurd amount of the most important stat in the game, Penetration. Though I would consider the previously mentioned options a bit more useful, this set also requires no DLCs and can be farmed in the Overlands of Malabaltor or be purchased in Guild Traders. As a final option, Seducer is a fantastic set for beginners to the game, providing a massive cost reduction to your mag abilities. The worst type of damage loss that you can suffer is running out of resources. So while learning the principles of resource management, this set will not only do decent damage, but give room for error in rotations. This is a craftable set that can be found in the second alliance zones, that is Stormhaven, Gratwood, or Deshaun. Getting into the most valuable meta sets, that is the gear sets that you will see run in the vast majority of content, depending on the situation of course. Starting with the strongest single target set in the game, Perfected Arms of Reliquin. This is a medium armor set that comes from the Trial Cloudrest. It is the absolute strongest pure single target set in the game, outputting roughly 9 to 11k DPS. This set should not be run however if you cannot maintain its 10 stacks consistently, which requires you to light attack the target at least once every 4 seconds. Generally, the longer the fight, the less the penalty is for dropping stacks, making this set worthwhile on fights like Yolnikrin in Sunspire for example. However, the shorter the fight, the larger the penalty is for dropping stacks. Therefore, if there is something preventing you from maintaining near perfect uptimes, especially in shorter instances, this set will not hold its value and is best replaced by something more consistently maintained. An example of this concept might be the first boss in VKA. Yandir jumps into the air under 50% health and he is untouchable for a few seconds. An extremely experienced player can light attack right before and right after he lands and still maintain Reliquin. But even an experienced player here could see stacks dropped if not performed perfectly, implying better options may exist. Coming from the same trial, Perfected Mantle of Sororia is a light armor set that offers 360 spell and weapon damage at max stacks. As a rule of thumb, classes that have a high damage output will begin to benefit more than other classes from sets that increase your overall damage. Usually, Riptide is the go-to for this concept, but the Magplar does not have a reliable way to keep the stamina pool low. This makes Sororia the next best option. Thanks primarily to Radiant Oppression, the Templar falls into this category, and Sororia will slightly outperform proc sets whenever we can effectively maintain its stacks. This requires a somewhat stationary fight, however, as stacks are based on standing still in a pretty small circle for a long enough period of time, and then dipping into that circle once at max stacks to maintain them. Now, normally, we want to avoid pairing trial sets as we double up on the minor slayer bonus by doing Doing so, however, the beam is so essential to the Plar's overall DPS output, and the damage difference between pairing these two trial sets together when compared to the typical Rally Aegis Caller setup is so small, it becomes worth losing that bonus for the sake of buffing our beam as much as possible. Reliquin and Sororia is the setup that we use on the dummy for this reason. And with that, coming from the dungeon on Hollowed Grave, Aegis Caller is a medium armor set and is the next strongest option that we can run on the Templar. Offering two lines of weapon and spell damage plus a line of crit, this 8 to 9k DPS set procs off of martial melee critical damage. This means that there is a bit of RNG to this setup, which can get a little bit annoying on the dummy. This set does do its damage in a large AoE radius, making Aegis Caller the strongest AoE proc set in the game. Of the proc sets we can run, Aegis Caller is likely the most difficult to track and maintain due to the aforementioned proc condition, martial melee critical damage. We will backbar this set when we run it most often, which means that only Stampede, Carve, and our light attacks can proc it if they crit. Stampede does have a guaranteed critical strike on its initial hit, making this skill the best to reproc Aegis Collar when necessary, but this will require you to reapply Stampede about 3 seconds early on average to keep good uptimes with the set. Keeping strong uptimes is going to be more of a damage gain than overcasting Stampede will be a damage loss, despite it obviously being unideal. On the Templar, there are not very many situations where we will run this set, but it is one of the absolute strongest in the game, and worth having on hand for certain situations. Next up, coming from the dungeon Falkreath Hold, Pillar of Nern is a versatile medium armor set and is worth only slightly less overall damage than Aegis Collar. If you are having a hard time sustaining the stamina necessary to overcast Stampede, you could choose to run this set instead, as it procs simply off of damage done, making it much easier to keep track of and proc on cooldown. Though primarily considered a single target set, Pillar can have AoE utility if stacks are tight and consistent enough. Perfected Whirl of Depths is a versatile light armor set found in the Trial Dreadsail Reef that does 7-9k DPS in a large AoE radius. This set does strong AoE damage and procs on damage, making it extremely versatile and easy to maintain 
in enraged situations when slightly stronger alternatives cannot be 100% managed. We typically will run Warl of Depths in mobile AoE fights where Reliquin would be useless and Sororia cannot be effectively maintained to ensure that we have a trial set active for the Minor Slayer bonus. When we can consistently get good value out of Whirl's AoE proc, that is, when all targets are easily and consistently hit by it, Whirl will be our strongest trial set AoE alternative that we can run on the Plar. In situations where we cannot get good value out of Sororia, Reliquin, or Whirl, however, Perfected on Souls Torment will be the best final alternative for AoE damage-oriented trial sets. This is a medium armor set coming from the Trial Sanity's Edge, offering a flat 7% damage done bonus, which doubles if you get an interrupt for 10 10 seconds. The bonus damage is not something that can be reliably maintained, I feel, as there are very few fights in the game that allow you to consistently interrupt targets to maintain the possible 14% damage done bonus. However, if you find yourself in one of these rare situations, this will be one of the outright strongest damage options for the Plar. A really simple high damage dealing setup involves Onsoul Torment paired with Deadly Strikes. Getting into the alternative set options, these can be paired with any of the meta set options depending on the fight, and in certain scenarios will even help to build combination stronger than any of the previously mentioned options. Starting with one of the most commonly used sets on the Templar, Deadly Strike. This is a medium armor set that can be found in the Bruma Vendor in Cyrodiil or can be purchased from Guild Traders. Deadly is one of the go-to medium armor sets to pair with either Onsoul or Whirl in content depending on your ability to maintain sets like Reliquin or Sororia. Deadly is very close in DPS output to the other meta set options, offering a 15% damage done increase to the vast majority of our skills, including Radiant Oppression. Whenever you cannot reliably maintain the meta setups or if you need a non-trial medium armor set, to run with Whirl, Deadly will be your go-to. Next up, Azerblight Reaper. This is a medium armor set found in the dungeon layer of Marsalok and is an incredibly powerful set on this class in particular in AoE type fights. Azerblight's damage is done after 20 stacks are built on a target, and these stacks are built with damage over time effects. Everything in this toolkit, with the exception of the beam, will build Azer stacks, including our spammable Puncturing Sweep. This means that the proc from the set is going to go off extremely often. To break down this set's functionality, Azer is best used in fights with two or more priority targets. The value of this set increases the more targets there are, but this is dependent on those targets' health. It will only be worth using Azer in situations where targets have enough health to get this set to proc at least once and can be held close enough together to ensure that the bomb hits all intended targets. Take for example a fight like Oak's Hard Mode. There are constantly at least two priority targets, but the short range of Azer makes it difficult to consistently ensure that the bomb will hit all priority targets. There are a ton of low health frogs that spawn throughout the fight, but their low health will never really allow Azer to build and proc since they are almost always killed instantly. These conditions make Azer not really worth running on Oaks. On Bosse, however, there is always at least a Flesh Atro or a Fire Behemoth stacked near the main boss throughout this entire fight. Each of these targets has enough health to get multiple procs of Azer before it's killed. Running this set on boss A is a no-brainer. A final note about the set's functionality, since there can only be one Azer proc at a time and there is a limit to how quickly stacks can be applied, your group's benefit from people running this set will cap out at around 4 players, maybe 5, as this is about the point in which Azer is constantly and consistently procking. Adding a 6th DD in Azer won't make it proc any faster and will begin to result and some losses. Overall, this set is an absolute must-have for the Plar, as its damage when it is worth using is completely unmatched and by far the strongest AoE set in the game. On this class, you'd likely run Azer in combination with either Solzon or Whirl, opting to front bar one of those two sets in Body Azer. Next up, Zogvin's Warband is a medium armor set found in the dungeon Frost Vault. Zogvin's is a really good set if you need extra bar space, which is a situation that you'll most often find yourself in when performing out-of-group mechanics, such as VSS or VCR portals. Zogvin's gives you a consistent source of minor force which allows you to drop trap in favor of a different skill. It also offers an extra line of pen, which is always really helpful in solo type 12 man situations. Next up, Perfected Souls on Torment is a medium armor set found in the trial Rock Grove. It is simply one of the best sets in the game in terms of damage output, but it has relatively difficult proc conditions, as well as requires some of the highest levels of awareness to achieve peak effectiveness out of all of the set options. Souls on's proc conditions require a target to die roughly once every 30 seconds, and when such an event occurs, a faint target is put on the said corpse. It can be a bit tough to see, but if there are enough small ads dying constantly throughout a fight, 
and you are aware enough to get this buff without losing time on target or faltering in your rotation, Solzon will provide the strongest damage boost out of really any other set. Examples of good places to use this set might be the first boss in VDSR, as the dog ads spawn consistently throughout the fight, or the first boss in VRG, as the frog ads spawn throughout the fight as well. Advancing Yokita is a heavy armor set found in the trial Hellra Citadel and is no longer particularly meta but still worth mentioning because it only provides 1-2k less DPS in a perfect world when compared to the meta sets. In situations where you might not be able to maintain any of the proc sets, whether it be for the sake of prog or mechanics, this is an extremely strong alternative, especially in short fights. The extra crit that you get from the set makes it incredibly bursty. That said, it is a heavy armor set so it must be run on the weapons and jewelry exclusively. Finally, known as a duo, the Elfbane and Mechanical Acuity sets go hand in hand, with Elfbane usually run on the back bar along with all of your flame-based skills on the back bar, and Acuity run on the front bar to control when your burst of near-perfect crit occurs. The idea is to extend all of your dot damage so that it lasts throughout the entire or nearly the entire duration of a short fight, while also allowing for more spammables during this time, as spammables make up the highest percentage of your overall damage since the changes in lost depths. This should be used in bursty situations situations, that is, boss fights that last 20 seconds or less, such as the spider in VHOF or the snake in VRG. If the fight is too short, you shouldn't have time to drop all of your dots in AoEs, making the setup weak on most trash pulls, but if the fight is too long, then the setup's burst value loses its worth, making it very niche. That said, mechanical acuity on its own, paired with Solzon most typically, can be used to burst down some of the toughest trash pulls in the game very quickly. Think the final set of trash before Fallgraven in VKA, the set of trash before Boss A, or the final set of trash before Teleria, for example. Since there are so many ads and these trash pulls in particular tend to take a little bit more time than the rest, Mechanical Acuity is a really solid set to run to get guaranteed crit on skills like your ultimate and primary spammables. For our trash sets this patch, not much is changing. This information primarily pertains to PC, but I believe is important for console players to be aware of as well, in order to better be able to optimize for console rating. The most common trash setup includes running Souls on on the body and burning Spell Weave on the back bar. Both of these sets allow for incredibly strong and easy to control burst damage. Burning Spell Weave is one of the most underrated burst sets in the game, offering nearly 500 weapon and spell damage whenever you deal flame damage, a proc condition that is incredibly easy to achieve, especially when running an Inferno Staff. An Inferno Staff will always be preferable in Trash so that we have access to the very large and high damage dealing Wall of Elements, as well as the incredibly bursty Destro ult. Burning Spell Weave spell and weapon damage increase only lasts 8 seconds though with a 12 second cooldown, meaning that in longer boss type situations, there are plenty of other stronger options. In short trash situations though, that shouldn't really be longer than 10 seconds anyway, we get nearly the full value out of this set's massive damage increase without having to worry about the cooldown. Souls on on the other hand is a no brainer, it's tough to get all of the crit damage modifiers necessary to hit that 125% crit cap active in such a short window of time in trash. Solzon will not only help make up for these discrepancies in crit damage, but also offer a ton of crit chance, helping to burst down trash even more effectively. And with that for our mythics this patch, the Velothier Mage's Amulet is the strongest mythic that we can run on the Plar in pretty much all content. This mythic provides a small amount of penetration, minor force, and a 15% damage done bonus, but reduces your light attack damage by 99%. Much like the Ark, this mythic works really well on the Plar because of Radiant Oppression. This two second channel means that the Plar light attacks less than any other class, making light attacks account for only 5-7% to of our overall DPS output, as opposed to other classes 8-10%. to Because of this, the net damage gain is going to be high enough to outperform any other alternative. Velothi is yet another set in this build that buffs our beam as well, and again, buffing our beam as much as possible is the best way to increase your DPS on a Plar. The next best option to Velothi would be Mora's Whisper. The conditions of this mythic are intense, requiring that you have a ton of Mage's Guild books for peak effectiveness, but if you do happen to have them, this will be the next best option for the Templar. Moras offers the highest amount of raw crit chance out of any mythic, and almost even any set in the game. Though Velothi will end up being a slightly higher damage dealing option overall, Moras is not far off in DPS. Most classes, however, will opt to run the infamous Harpooner's Waiting Kilt. The Kilt is a solid option, providing only 400 crit chance less than Moras, but also offering 10% additional crit damage at max stacks. However, this is unnecessary most of the time in 12-man content, as the Templar's unique passive Piercing Spear offers us a straight-up 10% increase in critical damage. For this 
reason, Moras and Velothi will almost always be the better option. The only exception would be if you find yourself in a situation where you are not reaching the crit cap, whether it be due to split group mechanics or even poor optimization. Unless the missing crit damage is extremely dramatic, Velothi will still likely be a bit better, but it's important to know that the kilt exists as an option to make up these discrepancies, especially if you're in an unoptimized group. Keep in mind though that you cannot run the kilt in fights where you take overt direct damage as you lose kilt stacks for every tick of direct damage you take. There are very few fights in the game where this is a problem, but keep an eye out. For our monster sets this patch, when opting for one of these sets in content, the strongest single target option for the Plar will be Zahn. This set will provide the strongest single target damage between any of the other monster options. Its one piece is a line of crit, making it really strong on classes that don't get crit passively. The raw damage of the set is only beaten by Kialnar, but because of its one piece, Zahn often ends up being a bit stronger than Kialnar for overall DPS, making this a must-have for single target fights. While this set can provide some AoE damage, it's not reliable and the set does require you to be somewhat in melee range. If you need AoE damage or cannot stay within melee range of the boss, I'd suggest using something different. As a strong AoE monster set for boss situations, Narayanith should be your go-to. The single target from this set is not the absolute strongest, but it is very competitive with Zahn and provides its damage in an AoE radius. Its proc conditions are incredibly simple, requiring direct damage to be dealt, and it does not have any niche element in order to maintain its proc. For trash situations though, where you're looking for bursty AoE damage, Grothar will be the best option. Though its single target will not hold up to that of any of the previously mentioned options, Grothar will be the best helm option for trash type fights. For single target burst situations though, I would suggest running Baylorg. This is a set used to maximize single target burst damage. Ideally, for a fight such as the Spider in Vhoff or the Snake in VRG, you would save 500 ultimate for the start of a fight and get the massive weapon and spell damage and penetration increase that the set provides for an ulti that large for about the entire duration of a fight. There are very few situations where this is possible as those buffs only last 12 seconds. But in the fights mentioned, that's about how long you either have to do damage to the target before it becomes invulnerable or about how long a fight should last anyway. Finally, if you choose to run an arena weapon and mythic combo, you'll have room for a one piece monster bonus. Slime Krog gives the strongest bonus out of any other set, oddly being the only helm whose one piece provides 771 crit chance compared to every other monster's one piece crit chance being 657. You'll opt for this one piece crit, assuming all penetration buffs are adequate. However, if you are short on penetration due to raid comp and or poor uptimes from the support in a 12 man situation, you can opt to run a set that offers a line of penetration for its one piece, such as Archdruid, Crag, Lady Malegda, or Valken Scoria. This 1478 pen can be very useful in making up for these types of discrepancies. Finally, getting into the arena weapons for this patch, since we are pairing two sets with very short timers, the traditional front bar back bar setup won't work very well for the Templar, meaning that we will most often choose to drop the monster set and run an arena weapon back bar so that we can front bar Sororia. Though not the raw strongest arena weapon, the Maelstrom Greatsword will work very well on the Plar for a few reasons. First and foremost, this arena weapon does not buff our beam damage, but it does buff Puncturing Sweep. This may seem counterintuitive, but the only other arena weapon we could run to buff our beam damage would be the Master's Bow. Running a weapon that buffs our beam requires that we keep an extra skill active, forcing us into casting Radiant Oppression a few times less over the course of a fight. In addition to this, we get a strong buff to a good amount of our overall DPS output in the jab section of the parse, while getting to drop Stampede a little bit sooner with less penalty when we get to the execute portion of our parse. The sooner that we get to XC, the sooner we get to do big damage on this class. Finally, Stampede and Carve are the strongest weapon skills in the game on their own. So for these reasons, the VMA Greatsword will be the arena weapon that we choose to run on the dummy and in long, straight single target situations in content. The next best option, the Master's Bow, gives 330 weapon and spell damage to targets infected by Poison Arrow. Though a weaker overall buff in the jabs portion of any fight, this weapon gives a solid increase in DPS to our execute phase, making the Master's Bow a near equally competitive option. The only downside is that running a bow places shorter skills on our bar and forces us to keep up more skills in Exe, reducing the amount of Radiant Oppression casts we can get in. In short single target or burst fights where we only get the chance to cast our dots and AoEs one time anyway, this is no problem, and the Master's Bow even becomes preferable. Likewise, most fights in the game require some sort of AoE damage, and the Master's Bow will be a much stronger option than the VMA Greatsword for Cleave in the vast majority of content, making the Master's Bow a must-have. 
Finally, the Maelstrom Inferno with Wall of Elements is one of the strongest set options for AoE that we can run in the game. This will be extremely difficult to sustain in boss type fights, however, due to the extra and frankly expensive mag skill Wall of Elements. For this reason, the VMA Inferno will be the go-to weapon for AoE burst situations like trash pulls. Running the VMA Inferno means that we would also get an extra skill to slot something else like Proxy Debt, for example. Running a Great Sword means that you slot Stampede and Carve. Running a Bow means that you slot Endless hail and poison injection, and running a staff means that you slot wall in a skill of your choice. The more pre-buff oriented skills that we have for trash, the better. Getting into our primary skills, these are the skills that we use on the dummy, acting as the highest potential DPS options for a pure single target fight in a perfect world with perfect uptimes. This is by no means the strongest bar setup that we will use in every fight, but rather this will act as a baseline to help us make good decisions when optimizing our bar setups fight to fight, based on the flex skill options we will discuss right after. Starting with one of the trademark skills of the Templar, Power of the Light is one of our strongest damage dealing abilities, outputting about 10 to 12k DPS when kept up a efficiently, making it one of the most important skills on our bar. We will apply this skill all the way throughout the parse until about 10%. As a key note, it's essential to ensure that this skill fully expires before reapplying it, as the damage from the skill comes from the explosion, which only happens once the timer expires. Reapplying this skill early will reset the timer and negate the damage. Power of the Light does just as much damage as its other morph, Purifying Light, making them interchangeable depending on what your sustain calls for. Power of the Light also offers Minor Breach, which isn't really that big of a deal in 12-man content, as this buff can be sourced through Pierce Armor or Ice Wall, but good to note for solo content for sure. Puncturing Sweep will be our primary spammable in this class. This skill has received tons of changes to its functionality over the last year, becoming much simpler to weave and doing insane damage thanks to Solar Barrage, a skill that we will discuss shortly. We will use this skill as our primary spammable for roughly the first 60% of a fight, and doing so will result in an impressive 15k DPS. This skill also heals for 33% of the damage done, which almost single handedly makes the Templar one of, if not the most survivable DPS class of them all. Barb Trap historically acted as our primary source of minor force, but with the Velothi Mythic, Trap is no longer necessary for that reason. We still run the skill though because Trap itself does very strong damage, as well as acts to buff our strongest abilities on the front bar, including jabs and radiant oppression through the passive Slayer in the Fighter's Guild, which increases our weapon and spell damage by 3% per Fighter's Guild ability slotted. The dot itself does roughly 3 to 4k DPS, but also acts as a consistent source of the extremely strong status effect hemorrhaging, which adds another 3.5 to 4k DPS, making Trap a dot that really does anywhere from 6 to 9k DPS in total. This makes Trap competitive with a skill like Power of the Light, a must-have. The generation is slotted on our bar for a couple of reasons. Its primary use is due to the fact that we are running ult pots, so we need a source of major sorcery, the spell damage buff. Degen provides this buff as long as the skill is active. The generation itself does pretty decent damage as well, doing about 3 to 4k DPS, being about as strong as any other alternative we could run in terms of raw DPS output anyway. Finally, we choose to slot it on the front bar to boost our max mag on the front bar through the Magicka controller passive in the Mage's Guild tree, which increases our max mag by 2% per Mage guild ability slotted. This will increase the damage of our top three DPS skills, Radiant Oppression, Puncturing Sweeps, and Power of the Light a bit. And with that, Radiant Oppression is one of the absolute strongest abilities in the game. This execute does an insane amount of damage, accounting for over 20% of our overall DPS, despite only using it in the last 40% of the fight. The beam was already insanely strong, but with the extra 5% damage increase we now get to the skill, thanks to recent changes to Solar Barrage in Update 39, and with the addition of the Volathi amulet in Update 38, this skill is busted. We use Radiant Oppression as an execute and it will replace jabs as our primary spammable at 40% and below in boss type fights, and though only active for roughly a third of our total fight time, we'll still do a whopping 30k total DPS, doubling our next strongest ability puncturing sweep. An insane skill to have. Our ultimate of choice on the front bar, Flawless Dawnbreaker, is mainly there to buff our front bar abilities through the Slayer passive mentioned earlier. That said, once you hit 40%, you actually want to start casting Dawn 
Dawnbreaker instead of Shooting Star in order to buff our beam and execute even further, as throwing two Dawnbreakers and increasing the damage of our beam will result in more overall DPS than throwing one total Meteor in that chunk of time. Moving on to the back bar, starting with Vampire's Bane, the skill is not really a strong dot on its own, doing only 3 to 4k DPS overall, but it does last a while, allowing for more overall spammables, as well as giving us the ability to run ult pots, as it gives both major prophecy and savagery while active, resulting in a higher overall damage gain despite the weak ticks. We will choose to make this one of the first skills that we drop in XE when we start beaming, along with degen though, and switch to the alliance spell damage pots to make up for no longer casting these skills. Next up, when running a great sword, Stampede is one of two skills that become a must-have option. Stampede is a very strong damage over time effect with an initial strike whose critical chance is guaranteed, resulting in about 6 to 8k total DPS with the skill. In addition to this, we use Stampede to proc the effects of the Maelstrom Greatsword, which increases our direct damage done by up to 560, scaling off of your weapon and spell damage. As discussed earlier, this primarily gives us a massive DPS increase in the jabs portion of the rotation and is an absolute priority to maintain, granted having a duration that lasts 3 seconds longer than Stampede itself. Once we start beaming, however, Stampede is only relevant for its actual DPS output and will be reapplied only one more time around roughly 20%. Carve, the damage itself from the skill, is pretty overrated, only outputting about 4 to 5k DPS. What makes the skill worthwhile is the duration. Because Carve provides a decent dot that lasts over 30 seconds, we are able to use more overall spammables over the course of a fight, while also receiving a decent bit of damage at the same time. More chances to use our spammables, especially beam below 40%, means more damage. And with that, one of the most important skills in this toolkit, Solar Barrage, this skill grants Sun Sphere for 20 seconds, which is a buff that increases damage with your class abilities by 5%. This doesn't really impact class dots like Vampire's Bane, for example, but does greatly affect skills like Puncturing Sweeps and Radiant Oppression. The damage from Solar Barrage on its own is relatively weak, doing less damage than Carve, but the buff it provides makes it well worth running. One of the stronger damage over time effects in this toolkit, Ritual of Retribution is one of the few dots that we use on the Plar for the sake of its DPS output. Ritual does its damage in a massive AoE radius, meaning that it is not only strong for single target fights, but very strong and versatile for AoE type fights as well. This skill also offers the Purify Synergy, which can be really helpful if you have a damage dealer running Alkosh, as this is one of the only synergies in the game that all 12 people can see at the same time, as opposed to the standard 6 that all other synergies in the game possess. Purify is also just a really good synergy to have access to in fights where mechanics may need to be purged, such as the first boss in VHOF or the first boss in VKA. And finally, our ultimate of choice, Shooting Star. This is our go-to ultimate on the plot of this patch when running a greatsword. Simply put, Shooting Star is one of the strongest ultimates in the game, and it does even better on the plot since we have natural cost reduction to our our ultimates thanks to the restoring spirit passive. Combine this in ult pots and the plar has the ability to drop a full extra ultimate over any other class, which is part of the reason we get such a high number on the dummy compared to other classes as opposed to in content. Remember though that we will opt to use Dawnbreaker over Meteor when we begin using Radiant Oppression at about 40% as buffing our beam plus using a few Dawnbreakers in Execute will ultimately result in more overall damage when compared to using just one more Meteor. Getting into the flex skills, that is, the skills that we can use situationally over the listed primary skills depending on specific fights and content. Starting off in the Adric Spear Tree, Blazing Spear is one of the strongest skills in the Templar Toolkit and it's a real shame that we don't really have any room for this skill. Blazing Spear does really strong instant burst damage on application, with an initial tick about as strong as the ticks of our spammables, while also providing a decent damage over time effect equal to that of Degen. When running an Inferno Staff, since we wouldn't be able to run Stampede or Carve, this is likely one of the first skills I would try to slot, assuming you can sustain it. Otherwise, it's a go-to flex skill to replace with Degen if you're not going to run ulti pots. Everlasting Sweeps is a solid ultimate equal to that of Shooting Star in overall damage output. The biggest drawback to the skill is that you cannot bar swap cancel off of it, making it a really good option for burst damage but slightly less optimal than Shooting Star over the course of a longer fight, as it will likely slow down your weaving a little bit or require you to sacrifice some dot up times elsewhere for the sake of having something to bar swap cancel off of. In the Dawn's Wrath Tree, starting with the other morph of 
of Power of the Light, Purifying Light does just as much damage, but rather than offering the minor breach debuff, heals nearby allies for a small amount over 10 seconds. The difference between the morphs is purely based on sustain. We have a lot of mag-based skills in the setup, so using Power of the Light helps with our mag sustain. However, if you are having no issues with mag and having some issues with stam sustain, you can run this morph instead. The other morph of Radiant Oppression, Radiant Glory does nearly as much damage, increasing DPS output with this ability by 480% instead of 500% based on enemies missing health, but heals you for 17% of the damage done with this ability. As you can guess, this ends up being some absolutely insane healing done. For solo situations or even certain 12-man scenarios that are extremely damage intensive or where you need to handle portal style mechanics away from healing, the slight damage loss could be worth the massive gain in survivability. Solar Disturbance, this is an interesting ult to be aware of for certain progression situations. As one of few sources of major maim in the game, a debuff that reduces the damage of your enemy by 10%, this skill can be helpful for certain situations that involve high damage taken fights, such as Fallgrave in hard mode in VKA, or if your damage is a little low, the very end of Assembly General in VHOF hard mode. In the Restoring Light Tree, Honor the Dead or Breath of Life is the strongest burst heal that this spec has access to. Both tick for upwards of 20k, the difference between the morphs is purely preference. Honor the Dead simply refunds part of the cost whenever you heal an injured target. Breath of Life offers healing to multiple targets. This makes Breath of Life slightly more reliable in content when you are not the only one around but need to run a heal, like in VSS hard mode portals for example. Channeled or Restoring Focus is another flex skill to be aware of that can help with some sustain issues. Essentially, casting either skill places a rune on the ground. While standing in this rune, you gain Major Resolve, which is a buff typically provided by support in 12-man content, increasing your resistances by nearly 6k. Standing in the rune also heals you for a bit. Channeled Focus, however, restores mag, and Restoring Focus restores stam. Neither of the resource restoration effects require you to be in the rune in order to get the bonus, but rather you simply need to have the skill active. So if you are struggling with mag, you can try slotting Channeled Focus to help with that, and if you're struggling with stam, you could try slotting Restoring Focus. Moving into the dual wield tree, Whirling Blades is the strongest and burstiest AoE spammable in the game. The only drawback is that it does cost quite a bit of stamina, especially on mag 2 where your stam pool is limited, you would really only ever slot this for trash pulls as sustaining this skill for entire boss fights is impractical. The AoE burst of the skill is unmatched though, so this is a priority swap for trash pulls when making those decisions on console. Deadly Cloak is a very strong damage over time effect, especially near the end of a fight, as the dual wield passive slaughter increases the damage of this ability by 20% against enemies under 25% health. In addition to this, Cloak is even more unique on the plar as it can help proc the flame and poison and enchantments on your front bar during your beam casts without having to light attack. On most classes, these enchants are reliably maintained by light attack weaving. However, on the plar, since we have a 2 plus second channel for 40% of the fight, Cloak is even more useful outside of its raw damage for better utilization out of our enchants, and therefore more status effect damage with burning and poison. Every weapon skill helps to proc that weapon's enchantments, so running an extremely strong skill like Cloak on its own, in addition to this bonus, makes it a must have. In in content, when you are provided with igneous weapons from the support, you'll be able to drop degen in favor of this skill. Finally, outside of its raw damage, Cloak also gives you major evasion, reducing damage taken from area of effect attacks by 20%. This should be a priority swap in content over degen when you have a tank providing the buffs degen gives for you. Moving into the bow tree, a bow setup on the back bar for the Magplar has dramatically increased in popularity, not only because of the buffs to bow in update 39, but because of the master's bow as well, as this set actually to buff the Templar's execute skill, helping it do insane damage when it matters most. You often integrate Templars into raid comps for trials with really important execute phases anyway, so increasing their damage for these phases is almost always worth it. The bow can also help solve sustain issues for this class, as sustaining mag can be really tough. Adding a couple of extra low-costing stam skills with the bow could be the difference between sustaining well and struggling for resources. With that, Endless Hail is a go-to skill when running a bow. This AoE will provide more overall DPS output than other DOT alternatives, such as Degeneration or Scalding Rune on its own, which makes it worth running. It also does its damage in a large AoE radius. However, it will by no means be the strongest skill in this toolkit, only slightly outperforming skills like Degen in single-target situations. Poison Injection on the Templar, you will likely 
likely opt to use the master's bow, which means that you would have to slot poison injection. The skill itself is a pretty decent dot, really doing the majority of its damage towards the end of a fight, but is most relevant due to the set that it's paired with, which offers 330 weapon and spell damage to targets afflicted by the skill. Again, this is just another way to increase our beam damage in Xe. Getting into the destruction staff tree, starting with force pulse, this is one of the strongest and most easy to use spammables when running a staff on the front bar. Though not quite as strong as a skill like elemental weapon when discussing ranged spammables, it is significantly easier to weave and not dependent on hitting your light attacks, resulting in a larger DPS output for the vast majority of the player base. This skill does also provide a bit of cleave, affecting up to two nearby enemies if they were already inflicted with a status effect, which will occur 90% of the time in 12-man content. That said, this will never be a higher damage dealing option than puncturing sweep, but more so is worth mentioning as an option for dual staff range players. The other morph, Crushing Shock, is a bit cheaper than Force Pulse and does only slightly less damage, but has the versatility of being a world sourced interrupt with a massive range. If you find yourself in a situation where interrupts come in handy, such as Vast, for example, Crushing Shock could be a really good option. Next up, Wall of Elements. When running a staff on the back bar, Wall is an absolute must have, as it remains one of the strongest dots in the game, outputting roughly 6 to 8k DPS. Unstable Wall is a bit niche, as the timing of the fight's phases have to line up well enough to make Unstable worth using. For example, if a phase lasts 30 seconds and then the boss goes invuln, but Wall explodes three full times perfectly within the fight, Unstable will be a little stronger than Blockade. Blockade, however, is usually your go to morph of Wall in content. Since our spammables are worth so much more of our DPS output, dots with longer durations are typically a bit more preferable in order to get more overall spammable casts. In situations where Unstable does not line up perfectly, this will be the go to morph. Destructive Reach is a bit of a niche dot, really only used in Vast when running a staff back bar. Destructive Reach's timer lines up near perfectly with the burst phase Olms has throughout the encounter, making it a relatively strong dot that will do damage throughout the entire burst phase, only needing one cast, allowing for more spammables, and therefore providing more burst damage in these short phases. Next up, though a bit niche, Elemental Susceptibility can be a strong dot to run when running a staff back bar if you have nothing better to run, especially on non-DK classes. Elisus provides increased burning damage, which is solid damage for all classes. This skill, however, sees its most value on a Warden, as Wardens benefit in damage from burning and shield, and Elisus keeps tremendous uptimes on both of these status effects. It also offers a long duration for Major Breach, which can be a bit more preferable for portal-type situations, where the damage dealers will need to provide this debuff for themselves, like in VDSR portals, for example. Elemental Rage, this is one of the strongest and burstiest ultimates in the entire game. This is a must-have for trash pulls whenever running an Inferno Staff, and a solid option for the Plar, which lacks a strong class ultimate for single target situations as well, especially those requiring burst. In the Light Armor Tree, Dampen Magic is the best shield that this class has access to. In any raid situation where you may find survivability to be an issue, with healers present, mitigating damage will be more effective than a heal. In essence, once you're receiving more HPS, that is, heals per second, then health that you have, no amount of extra healing will make an impact in your survivability. This is incredibly easy to achieve with two healers. A damage shield, especially this morph, essentially gives you extra health to work with, relieving pressure in damage intensive situations. This is opposed to situations though where you might have to step away from a healer, such as VCR or VSS portals, which require you to run a heal rather than a shield since you are getting no healing provided. Keep in mind though that this skill does require five pieces of light armor to be equipped, which will be a bit of a damage loss replacing medium armor pieces. Moving into the fighter's guild tree, the main skill worth noting is Camo Hunter. This skill acts as a strong buff option when attempting to maximize either burst damage or simply maximize damage with your spammables. Camo Hunter gives 3% weapon and spell damage thanks to the fighter's guild passive Slayer, as well as provides minor berserk while slotted and flanking your target. Minor berserk is usually sourced by combat prayer given by the healers. However, certain fights in the game, such as Vass, make it impossible for healers to keep adequate minor berserk uptimes on the DDs, making the skill extremely valuable in that fight and other like it. In the Mage's Guild tree, much like Camo Hunter, Inner Light is a useful skill for buffing burst, front bar, and or spammable damage, as this skill provides 7% additional max mag, a DPS increase equal to that of roughly 2 to 300 spell damage, via the 5% max magica increase that the skill itself provides, as well as the 2% max mag increase for slotting a Mage's Guild skill, thanks to the passive magica controller. On a mag spec, Inner Light will be stronger than Camo Hunter on the dummy, but Camo Hunter will likely be a bit more useful in content, assuming you can 
can flank the boss at all times, as it will help achieve perfect uptimes with Minor Berserk. The other morph of Degeneration, Structured Entropy, provides a nice balance between damage and survivability. This morph does just as much damage as Degen, but rather than providing the spell and weapon damage buffs, it gives a decent little heal over time. This is a go-to skill for longer fights where you shouldn't really need a burst heal per se, especially if you're experienced, but where simply having some sort of healing would be necessary. The primary example that comes to mind is the VSS hard mode portal mechanic. Ideally, you don't want to sacrifice damage by slotting a heal if you can avoid it, and with enough practice and experience, structured can be enough to help you get through this fight. Scalding Rune is a decent AoE magic of flex dot to be aware of, outputting roughly 4 to 5k DPS. This skill is only slightly weaker than degen, but provides strong burst on impact, as well as a decent and long damage over time effect that will apply to any target hit by the initial application. This skill isn't always reliable as a source of AoE damage, but is worth being aware of for its AoE capability. In the Sigic skill tree, Elemental Weapon is technically the strongest range mag based single target spammable in the game when not running the Velothi Mythic. However, this skill does have an extremely high mastery curve as missing just one light attack completely negates the effectiveness of this ability. In addition to this huge factor, the skill is also incredibly clunky, which makes it easy to miss light attacks. There are very few situations that make this skill worth running, if any, but if you want a ranged alternative to jabs, you can use this skill if you prefer. Race Against Time is a solid skill that can be used as a pre-buff to boss fights or in trash pools as a source of minor force when not running the Velothi Mythic, as this skill gives the buff to the caster for 20 seconds when used. In situations where you might not be able to pre-buff with trap, you can quickly slot, use, and unslot Race Against Time to ensure that you have minor force, the buff provided by trap as the fight begins until you're able to naturally cast trap in your rotation. Likewise, in trash pools, it is rarely ever worth using trap, even for the minor force, as your spammable just holds too much value in these incredibly short fights, making Race Against Time an ideal skill to slot instead to pop between trash pools. Moving into the Undaunted Tree, starting with Shadow Silk, though I've never seen this skill used throughout a fight by a DD, Shadow Silk is still a noteworthy skill in my opinion. It is likely the weakest skill listed here, but not by much. It acts as a pretty decent stam AoE, outputting a solid 4 to 5k DPS, but with a massive handicap of only being 10 seconds long. I've seen it used most often as a skill to pre-buff with, especially on PC, where you can swap between a pre-buff and full damage setup with the press of a button. There are some fights where this is somewhat doable on console, requiring the boss have a very long spawn time, such as Rakat and Vima, for example. This skill also offers an extremely strong synergy, perhaps even the strongest synergy in the game. The Black Widow synergy gives a 10 second dot to any DD far enough away from the skill, requiring some sort of range fight to maximize this skill's value. Shadow Silk is usually best run on a support, but it's a skill that everyone should know about in my opinion. Mystic Orb provides a little more damage than any of the flex skills we've discussed to this point, such as Degen, Rune, Shadow Silk, or even Caltrops, and provides the group with the Combustion Synergy, which does a ton of damage and restores resources. The only problem is that, like Shadow Silk, it only lasts 10 seconds, and Orb is not really strong enough to be worth the amount of casts you'd have to spend, resulting in less casts of spammables. It's probably a good idea to have either one DD or one of your support run this skill for the sake of overall group DPS with the synergy, and for sustain, but it will be a slight personal DPS loss. Finally, in the Assault Tree, starting with Resolving Vigor, this is one of the strongest heals that any class has access to, period, especially since the skill was hybridized. Not only does Resolving Vigor provide a massive heal over time, it also gives Minor Resolve, increasing physical and spell resistances by about 3,000. This doesn't sound like a huge deal, but this buff provides a noticeable increase in survivability. In any situation where you might have to perform mechanics away from healing and without the opportunity to consistently use jabs on a target, this should be your go-to. Its other morph, Echo, Vigor, however, does have some use even on a DD. I've seen this morph used quite often in sweaty 4 and 12 man situations, where you might opt to drop a healer altogether in 4 man, or only run one healer in 12 man. For example, if you drop the healer in 4 man, it's usually wise to have all 3 DDs slot Echoing Vigor, and if the group is experienced enough, this amount of healing will suffice for most content. Likewise, in 12 man content, a group pushing score in VSS might use only one healer, slot some DDs with Echoing Vigor, and position them carefully to stack the healer on all DDs during beam phase on low card mode. The heal is very strong and this alone is enough to survive a damage intensive mechanic, as mentioned in an extremely experienced group. Anti-Cavalry Caltrops is my go-to flex skill on the mag spec as it provides as much damage as degen or scalding, that is roughly 4-5k, to in a large AoE radius. 
This skill also costs stamina, making it a useful addition to a bar setup for the sake of making mag sustain easier. If you have a free slot and don't really know what to use, you can't go wrong with Caltrops. The other morph of this skill, Razor Caltrops, provides the same amount of damage per second, but doesn't give as much overall value as Anti-Cavalry Caltrops due to its 10 second duration, as opposed to the other morphs 15. This skill is extremely useful though in solo or four man content for the sake of AoE Major Breach. When you don't have anybody to provide this buff for you, Razor Caltrops will end up being a must-have, as hitting pen cap on all of your targets is one of the most important steps in doing good damage. And finally, Proximity Detonation is a really strong, burst-oriented skill that can be used in trash pulls. The goal is to cast the skill as a pre-buff, attempting to time the cast so that it goes off right at the beginning of the pull before anything dies. This skill does its damage based on targets hit, so you want to make sure that this skill hits your primary targets in addition to all of the little adds usually associated with trash pulls to maximize its value. If you can use it as a pre-buff consistently in this way, it will be worth slotting. Before getting into the static and dynamic rotations for the Templar, I'd like to take a brief moment to go over all of the basic elements in doing damage on this class, concepts which will apply to both rotations. These concepts will help to teach why the design static rotation works well and help you to understand how to properly perform the slightly higher damage dealing dynamic rotation. After discussing both rotations, I'll take a brief section to discuss what adapting these rotations for real content scenarios might look like. So with that, we'll start by talking about the cornerstone of the entire rotation, Power of the Light. This skill does a small amount of damage initially on application and a massive explosion of damage on expiration. However, if we reapply the skill before the timer runs out, we miss the majority of the damage that this skill does. For this reason, we need to make sure that we are allowing Power of the Light to fully expire and make sure that we are reapplying the skill immediately on expiration to maximize our damage with this class. You can either track the timer or get an internal metronome going, counting out Power of the Light. One, two, three, four, five, Power of the Light and so on. Figure out what works best for you. One of the next most important elements in doing damage revolves around how we maintain our set procs. Even though the setup is pretty easy to maintain so long as we are consistently light attack weaving well, if you don't want to go through the trouble of tracking Sororia, make sure that you don't cast more than three skills on your back bar in a row. More often than not, this won't be an issue, but if you're caught in the wrong place at the wrong time and you're not being mindful of your Sororia procs, you could end up losing your stacks, resulting in a devastating DPS drop. Reliquin is pretty easy to maintain, the only danger of losing this set begins when you start beaming. Really make sure that you're hitting your light attacks between beam casts. Missing one isn't the end of the world, but if you miss two light attacks back to back, you will lose your Reliquin stacks, resulting in a massive DPS drop. This concept applies really to any set that you choose to run, whether it be a proc set that you should attempt to reapply on cooldown, like Pillar and or Whirl, or a set that functions in a similar way, such as advancing. And with that, be aware of and practice the skills on this class that weave abnormally. On the Templar, this concept applies to Puncturing Sweeps, Radiant Oppression, and Stampede. Puncturing Sweeps weaves a lot like Frags on the Sork, mimicking the 0.8 second cast time. This means that the skill can be weaved within the typical one second global cooldown, but you have to really hold off on queuing your light attack until right at the end of the skill. Radiant Oppression works in a similar way, but rather having a cast time of 1.8 seconds. I found that the best time to queue the light attack for this skill is right when you see the timer hit 0.3 seconds. If you react to that as soon as you see it, you'll time your light attack really well. Note that neither of these skills can be bar swap canceled, so you will have to plan your skill route accordingly, either letting skills run out on the back bar for a couple of seconds until a front bar skill that can be bar swapped off of, like Trap, Power of the Light, or Degen is ready to be reapplied, or reapply one of these skills early for the sake of not letting a back bar skill drop. I personally can't stand parsing on the Templar because of these two skills, but they are just too strong to drop. Make sure that you take some time to practice the weaving on these skills outside of a full parse until it begins to feel natural. Finally, Stampede isn't very tricky to weave, you just have to know how to do it. The skill locks you in place if you cast it by itself, but any sort of movement will break that lock. Slightly wiggling the thumbstick on a controller or just tapping the W key on a keyboard while casting the skill allows it to be bar swap canceled and weave completely normally. The last core concept to doing damage on this class is based around your timers. 
In a perfect world, a rotation should be built in a way that allows you to reapply a skill as soon as it fully expires. However, this is impossible to do with the static rotation, as we will discuss in more detail shortly, and is not even very possible with the dynamic rotation. Because we cannot bar swap off of skills like jabs or beam, we have to make smart decisions regarding which skills we want to either reapply early or let fall off for a couple of seconds, until a skill on the front bar that we can bar swap off of is ready to be reapplied. To make good decisions, we have to know which skills have priority. For example, Trap, Degen, Vampire's Bane, and Solar Barrage are all essential for buffing our damage. If any of these skills are going to fall off during a string of jabs, it's probably best to reapply them a little early so that they don't fall off during the spammable phase. Likewise, Carve is another big priority, because if you let it fall off, you lose the massive 30 second duration of the skill, effectively negating its value as a long dot. On the other hand, Ritual is an AoE that you want to allow to fully expire, because it ramps up in damage as time goes on. If you reapply it too early, you miss the most powerful tick of the skill making it one that we would prefer to allow to fully expire. And now that we know the basics of doing damage on this class, let's talk about the execute phase. Essentially, we want to begin beaming somewhere between 40 and 42%. You can start beaming around 42% if your resources are hurting, otherwise try to save it until 40. At this point, the beam becomes our priority over anything else, with maybe the exception of carve. If we know a skill is about to expire in one second, we will not under any circumstances reapply it early. We will cast one more beam, then begin in reapplying skills. We will want to make our last cast of abilities between 15 to 20%, with the only exceptions being Trap, Solar Barrage, and Power of the Light. At 10% and below, we will allow everything except for Solar Barrage to expire and beam until the end of the fight. Finally, there are a few really niche ways of doing damage on this class that can influence your damage and rotation as well. For example, we can stop casting Degeneration and Vampire's Bane around 35 to 40% in the fight if we swap potions. I know this might sound complicated, but it's pretty easy to swap from Heroin pots to the Alliance spell pots in the middle of a beam. You have two full seconds to do so. If you don't opt to do this, you will have to keep up Degeneration and Vampire's Bane until the end of the fight, with the last cast of each skill taking place between 10 to 15%. Likewise, we can pre-buff the dummy parse in a couple of unique ways as well. Sustain on the Templar can get really tricky, so to help with this, you can slot Rune Focus and Radiant Aura, use them before you start the parse, and then unslot them, giving you these massive sustain bonuses for the first portion of a fight. As meaningless as this might seem, it can be the difference between sustaining and not sustaining green max mag food. Finally, as always, you can throw a Dawnbreaker before starting a fight, and then hit the Ethereal Well to get the extra weapon and spell damage through your first ultimate. Both of these pre-buffs will have very minimal impact on your parse, but if you're trying to maximize your damage, can be worth the last couple K DPS you're trying to push. If you're not interested in maximizing your damage, I'd simply advise running ult pots the entire way through the fight and skip this super pre-buff altogether. If you don't want to or can't afford to run ult pots, Alliance spell pots will not be a significant DPS loss. Just stop casting degen and vamp bane when you start beaming. Keep in mind too that this class is a massive crit farm. If that beam crits poorly, you do not do damage. But if it crits well, you do a ton of damage. Aim for a consistent DPS goal about 3 to 4k off of what you would like as a max parse, and then decide if you want to crit farm. For example, if your goal is 120k, aim to consistently hit between 114 and 117k, and if you're doing that, you're likely a good set of beam crits away from that 120, and can then decide if you'd like to farm for that parse or not. Now that we understand the fundamentals of this class, we can put all of this information together to determine a solid static and dynamic rotation that will work well for single target boss type fights. Starting with the static rotation, I built this to be very beginner friendly. I ended up parsing about 124k with the static rotation and about 128.6k with the dynamic rotation. Both of these parses had some pretty mediocre crit and had they mimicked the types of crits that we're going to see very shortly here from Rai, would have probably been at least another 2 to 3k higher. So I would expect this static setup to parse about 5 to 6k lower than that 132k we saw from Rai. You can decrease this difference in damage potentially by attempting to integrate dynamic concepts into this build, such as reapplying Stampede on cooldown, or integrating Vampire's Bane plus Heroism Pots, and tracking that dynamically as well. Even taking these two steps will likely narrow the difference in damage from a 5 to a 6k difference to a 2 to 3k difference. As always, I recommend using the static rotation if you're newer to the class or even to the game to familiarize yourself with the Templar and its unique weaving, with the goal being to work your way up to the dynamic rotation. So with that, 
the only change to this build from the dynamic roto involves a single skill swap. We opt to drop Vampire's Bane for the sake of getting our timers to line up, slot inner light on the front bar, and run degeneration on the back bar in place of Vamp Bane. This allows for a very clean 18 to 19 second rotation that is based on our six second power of the light timer. Since we opt to drop Vamp Bane, we will end up using the Alliance spell power pots throughout the entire parse. Enough explanation, let's check out the rotation. We will start with a pre-buff of Shooting Star and Trap, then we will throw our first light attack which will signal the opening of the parse. We will immediately follow that light attack with Power of the Light, Stampede, Ritual, Solar Barrage, Degeneration, Carve, Power of the Light, Spam 5 times, Power of the Light, Carve, Spam 4 times, and then we start the actual rotation, which looks very similar to the opening. That rotation goes Power of the Light, Stampede, Ritual, Trap, Solar Barrage, Degeneration, Power of the Light, Spam five times, Power of the Light, Spam five times, Repeat. Once the target hits 40%, we will simply cast Radiant Oppression three times in place of the five times jabs cast. The only skills that you need to track somewhat dynamically are Carve and your Ultimate. Ideally, you should try to use these two skills in place of a spammable cast. You can always do this with your Ultimate, but you should stop your rotation and throw in Carve whenever it's about to run out as necessary. As you get more experienced, you can begin to plan for Carve falling off, trying to recast it right after Power of the Light, best case scenario, to ensure that you're following the rules regarding bar swapping that we discussed earlier. As a rule of thumb, if you cast Power of the Light and Carve has less than 6 seconds before expiration, you can reapply it early. You'll replace the 5 times Puncturing Sweeps part of the rotation with 3 times Radiant Oppression instead once you hit about 40%. Once you get to that 15-20% to 20 mark, you'll do a full rotation one more time and then beam only until the target is finished. As a final reminder, this rotation is a good starting point but will not maximize your damage. Check out the dynamic rotation and begin integrating some of the concepts discussed there into your static rotation to further increase your damage. And with that, getting into the dynamic rotation, our skill setup will mimic that of what we discussed in the primary skills section of the video. There are quite a few components to this rotation, but ultimately the goal is simply to reapply skills right as they expire. This is a little trickier on the Pilar as opposed to other classes since we cannot bar swap off of jabs or beam, so we have to just try to plan accordingly. If we run into the situation where skills are about to expire simultaneously, you should follow a priority of reapplication, which is simply determined by skills that either buff our overall damage the most or by skills that do the most raw damage, with each priority affecting our overall DPS output slightly more than its previous counterpart. That priority goes Carve, Power of the Light, Trap, Vampire's Bane, Degeneration, Solar Barrage, Stampede, and Ritual. Keep in mind that Solar Barrage becomes more important than Vampire's Bane if Power of the Light is about to explode, but is less important than anything else if this is not the case. Note that, with this rotation, sustaining max mag food is incredibly difficult. I personally used Ghastly Eyeball and only parsed a few K below Rise 132 with worse crit, so using Ghastly shouldn't really result in a huge loss. For the actual rotation, there are varying degrees of pre-buffs that you can follow. Each variation has a minimal impact on your overall DPS output, but if you're trying to push the absolute most damage, here's what you should do. When running max mag food, try to start your parse when your potion timer is halfway through its cooldown, and make sure that you wait 5-7 to seven seconds to take your first shard, to ensure that you return as close to 100% mag as possible without actually hitting 100% once you take the shard to maximize your resource return. Throw Degeneration and Vampire's Bane on the dummy to activate the damage and crit buffs, then reset the dummy. Go to your well, throw Flawless Dawnbreaker, and cast Channeled Focus and Radiant Aura for some extra sustain help, hit the well, and then swap out those skills while you're using the well, then begin the pre-buff. If you don't care about squeezing out that extra 1-2k, to 2K, this is where you start. Pre-buff with Shooting Star and Trap, then throw your first light attack signaling the opening of the parse. After that light attack, the opening goes Stampede, Power of the Light, Ritual, Solar Barrage, Degen, Vamp Bane, Carve, Jab one time, Power of the Light, and from here on out, you'll reapply timers as they expire. Remember the rules regarding bar swaps and timer prioritization. It's okay to let Stampede and Ritual expire, but reapply our buff-oriented skills early if they need to be reapplied during a string of jabs. Remember, the effect of the Maelstrom Greatsword lasts 3 seconds longer than Stampede, so Stampede can expire for a few seconds with little penalty. You will start using Beam over jabs at about 40%. Here you can make another sweaty decision. You can swap two Alliance Spell Pots so that you don't have to worry about keeping up DG or Vamp Bane. I like to wait until the first or second beam, 
and swap potions while I'm beaming here. If you do this, you don't have to worry about reapplying degen or vamp bane below 40%. If you do not, keep them up until about 12%. Your last cast of ritual should happen between 20 and 25%. Only refresh carve above 12%, otherwise let it drop. Keep up solar barrage, trap, and stampede as long as possible, but under 10% just beam. While I maintain that the 21 mil is a great place to practice and learn about a class and its unique damage, content demands that you make some slight adaptations to the pure single target rotation in order to maximize the damage that you do in PvE encounters. For example, while this rotation is great for long single target fights, like the bosses in VKA or in Sunspire for example, this rotation will not be the absolute most optimal way to go about burst oriented fights, especially AoE burst situations like trash pulls. In general, this rotation can be adapted to two main situations, single target in AoE burst. Single target burst fights encompass entire boss fights or boss phases where it would not be worth reapplying any more dots or AoEs. In general, spammable damage accounts for nearly 30 to 40 percent of our overall DPS output. The only thing that makes dropping skills like dots and AoEs worthwhile is the damage that we can get out of them over their entire duration, over the course of an entire fight. For example, a skill like Ritual ticks for about 11k every 2 seconds. Over the course of its entire duration, it will do 110k damage. If the skill gets its full duration, this will result in roughly 5k DPS over the course of an entire fight. In a burst situation though, where you may only get to damage the boss for 8-12 to 12 seconds, this skill will get half its value only doing a total of 55k damage. Compare this to a spammable like Jabs, which does 60k damage for one cast, and it's clear that it would have been more worthwhile to cast a spammable here instead of reapplying Ritual. So when is this concept applicable? As a general rule, a single target burst phase encompasses about a 5 to 10 second window that you have to do damage before you can't damage a boss anymore. This happens on every single boss fight in the game. For example, if a boss is at 5 million HP or less, this means that there are are about 5 seconds or less until the boss is dead, indicating a burst phase. If a boss is one mechanic away until it goes into a mechanic where they are invulnerable, this indicates a burst phase. An example might be Zalvaka before she ports, the dragons in Sunspire before they fly into the air, or Lylanar in Turlacil before they do their interrupt mechanic. If the boss has short damage phases that are a part of the fight structure, like Ohms and Asylum Sanctorum, these are burst phases. Finally, bosses with little to no health like the spider in Vihoff or the snake in VRG are fights short enough to be considered full-on burst fights, which would still entail that it would not be worth reapplying any dots or AoEs once cast. As a general rule, if you cannot get at least half the duration of your dot or AoE, it is not worth reapplying. The plar is a bit unique with its execute in this sense as well. We have to consider the boss's total health. 20% of Fallgraven and 20% of the Arch Custodian are two totally different health thresholds. The lower the total health of a boss, the more valuable beam is because you will jump from 40 to 20 percent much quicker. Once you are familiar enough with a fight, you can gauge when that value will be applicable. It will be worth reapplying a couple of dots just before you hit this window a little early if they are going to expire soon. But if that window is open, you're kind of stuck with what you gave yourself in terms of preparation. For example, assume that we are above beam health percent threshold on a fight like Zalvaka. In this fight, she'll usually do three mechanics on the first floor before the first port. If you didn't reapply some dots a little early in preparation, by the time mech 3 comes along, your best off just spamming and taking the L with what damage could have been. However, if you anticipate this and reapply a couple of skills that will fall off during this burst phase one or two seconds early and then spam only during the last mechanic just before she ports, you maximize your damage. On fights like Vasto that don't require any guesswork regarding the burst phase, the rotation will be consistent. It will only ever be worth laying your dots in AoEs one time after a protector dies and then using your spammable only until the next protector is up. Fights like the Spider and Vihoff work a similar way. This fight allows you to drop all of your dots and AoEs and then spam only until the boss is either invuln or finished. If the boss is in beam threshold, it will never be worth reapplying anything in these short fights because that percentage is going to drop extremely quickly. And with that, the biggest mistake I see players make is how they conduct their trash damage. Each and every trash fight in the game is a burst type of fight. The adds usually have anywhere from 2 to 3 million health apiece for high priority targets. Divide that by 8 damage dealers and that's at most about 400,000 damage that you need to do to a target each. Quick math says that your spammable will get you there 
far faster than any DOT or AoE. Again, in this toolkit, you have to wait 20 seconds to get 110k damage out of a skill like Ritual. You can use the skill at the start of a fight, sure, but why use that skill in the middle of a trash pull if your spammables will get you 120k damage in 2 seconds? The best rule to follow for trash is to pre-buff with as many skills as you can, but when the fight starts, do not cast more than 2 DOTs or AoEs and then only use your spammable. Again, preparing for trash is what will maximize your damage, but if you make a mistake in that preparation, don't decrease your damage further with useless casts. Your spammable is worth so much more than anything else in your toolkit for these types of pulls. Stop laying all of your dots in AoEs. Pick two and then spam only. If everyone in your group does this, especially with an AoE spammable, your trash damage will increase tremendously. Thank you so much everybody for checking out the video. As always, if you found the video helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, and let me know in the comment section below if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. I pride myself on responding to every single comment and feel free to test me on that statement. Be sure to join the Discord to get the full written guide for this build. The written guide has over 20 pages of information, most of which is in this video, but the written guide is an easy way to control F your way through any topic that you might not feel super comfy on. It also includes some more information about basic concepts and damage dealing that apply to every class, so be sure to check it out. Likewise, I'm on Twitch, Twitter, TikTok, in Patreon, so be sure to shoot me a follow on those platforms as well. I would greatly appreciate it. And a special shout out and thank you to the one and only Rye ESO for providing this insane 132k parse that we're getting ready to take a look at. Rye is an up and coming ESO creator on YouTube, so be sure to subscribe to his channel for some awesome parse videos. His link is in the description. And another special shout out and thank you to all of my current patrons Clyde, Reef, Flug, Joseph, thank you so much for your support and for making this video possible. I could not do it without you, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. And thanks to all of you as well for all of your love and support. I appreciate each and every one of you, and I will see you in the next one. Your choice to make a little mockery, it won't do.